I'm Stephen Foskett. I'm the organizer of the Tech Field Day event series. What you're about to see is a presentation with uh, Dell EMC and a panel of independent writers and speakers from around the world who focus on enterprise IT technology. If you'd like to see more about this, you can go to techfieldday.com. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like it, go to youtube.com slash techfieldday. Hadoop. So this is an interesting thing. So we have, uh, today we, we, we measure that about a thousand of our customers are using or have licensed Hadoop, which is a, a free license. Our protocols are free. So they have a zero dollar Hadoop license on their cluster, which allows them to go and take a Hadoop environment and point it at the cluster to do analytics directly, as opposed to keeping that data on the nodes itself on the Hadoop nodes. Now, the advantage of that is that I can do in-place analytics. I don't have to go and actually read data out of the storage system into Hadoop cluster and do that loading and then actually go and do transformation or some kind of analytics against it and then put it back, which is what really consumes a lot of time. Imagine if I have a Hadoop cluster and I have a multi-petabyte data set that I want to go and analyze. If I had to go and suck the multi-petabytes over the network into the Hadoop cluster, analyze it, and then put it back, that takes a lot of time. In this case, the uh, Hadoop uh, uh, API is actually provided by the cluster itself. And so when I'm actually accessing data files, they uh, appear as though they're part of a DAS, or a direct attached storage. They appear like local available uh, file system. Uh, but you're just talking over the network directly to the cluster. We have our own name nodes that are replicated <coughs> essentially on, or, uh, on every one of these um, uh, nodes. And so you have complete availability that if any node goes down, it's not like you lose namespace access. Um, the other thing is we don't do triple replication. So Hadoop typically protects data by keeping three copies of every data file. We don't need to do that because we do the striping and the erasure coding within this cluster. Uh, so it's a very low cost way, low, low footprint way for customers who have a lot of Hadoop data to provide high performance, no need to do the loading uh, analytics. And you see this at, you know, really a couple, maybe 200 terabytes plus, this becomes interesting. If you're talking about customers who have a petabyte or two petabytes of data that they do analytics against, um, putting that into a Hadoop cluster maybe is massive overkill. You might not meet, need that much compute capacity. Now you're licensing Hadoop across all of those nodes. And so the cost can become quite high for when maybe you only need 10 compute nodes and you have a very large repository of very high efficiency, high utilization, deduplicated data that's kept in the centralized data store. So instead of, hey, the data is now triple replicated across maybe 30 or 40 Hadoop nodes, where now I'm licensing 30 or 40 compute nodes, I actually keep it in a centralized data store. Lower the cost, provide enterprise data protection. So replication, snapshots, all of the enterprise features that we provide, including compliance, if you want to go and set worm on the nodes, are provided by this Hadoop infrastructure. Because we can speak different protocols, you can actually talk two different Hadoop uh, versions at the same time. So if you have Hortonworks version X and Hortonworks version Y, you can actually speak both of those simultaneously into the same data set. In fact, you could uh, use two different distributions, Hortonworks and Cloudera, to talk to the same exact data set. We have customers who ingest data over NFS. So imagine machine log data coming in over NFS into a cluster, and then it's analyzed by a separate Hadoop cluster that's running Hadoop compute nodes that are looking at that machine generated data. Rather than it going into the Hadoop cluster, it's actually maintained here for very high efficiency and enterprise data features. Questions or thoughts on this? Nope. So we talked about Swift. Um, Swift is just another one of our data lake capabilities, another protocol into the same data. Again, the difference here is that as opposed to keeping a session open as NFS and SMB would do, this is a very sessionless, hey, get put uh, uh, way of actually getting it data. The ob object base uh, it is, is used for not holding sessions open all the time. Um, and obviously it's, it's uh, you know, the way that a lot of the industry is moving for a lot of these kind of platform three type applications. It's, so we, we put it in to give you uh, that access capability on top of our existing data lake. Just to confirm as well, if you're using multiple protocols, can you access the same data using those protocols? Absolutely. All, all, all the protocols are just different. Think of it as a, the data lake's just a, a lake, and the protocols are just straws into that lake. So 
I can go over one straw, I can go over the other straw, it's all into the same data lake. They're pipes, or whatever you want to call them. That's one of the key things. I mean, when you talk about all the services again, from a distributed systems standpoint, um, uh, all of those individual protocols all slurp from the same eventing infrastructure that David <clears> was talking about. They all slurp from the same identity and management infrastructure. Uh, so the same LDAP uh, or AD or NIS or kind of directory services that you want to do. So there is a single uh, kind of security ACL uh, that the that the system keeps within 1FS and then that is morphed into the context of what is expected from a protocol perspective, whether or not that's an NFS v4 ACL, whether or not that is a UGO bit, whether or not that is, uh, you know, the the uh, ACE and, and the and the ACLs from a from an NTFS SMB presentation layer, et cetera. Okay, so you asked about some of the things we provide in terms of cluster reporting. So this is an example of Inside IQ and what it can do from a performance or from a capacity reporting perspective. And then of course we have capacity forecasting and trending capabilities to show you how fast you're using the cluster and when you're going to run out of space potentially. But we do. Uh, oh, actually, I, took, I don't have it in here. But there's performance graphs as well. I should have put it in uh, that show you basically how the cluster is basically performing, and you can basically take a look at that historically as well. All that information, again, is available over the API. So if you wanted to go and take all of that information and pipe it into some kind of another graphing tool, a graphing tool of your choice, you can do that as well. Uh, the SD Edge, this is the, the uh, virtualized version of our product. You asked about whether there's a free version that take you do it your home, at home. That's the free version. It's up to 36 terabytes, I guess. I didn't know that it was up to 36 terabytes these days. But it doesn't include the replication capabilities smart lock, which is our compliance, or cloud pools. So if you want to use those three features, you have to use the paid version. Very inexpensive. The intent here is not to really drive a lot of revenue around the uh, SD Edge or the, the software version of our product. The intent there is to make sure that that's ubiquitous, driving more and more data into our core. Um, so 36 terabytes, up to six nodes. Uh, this one has formal support, whereas the freak version, you can go to our community site and basically ask questions and people, end users can kind of help each other. Support does log on there and provide some information about, hey, you know, if you had some issues, common issues, we could go in and help you with that. But that's kind of the difference between the two. So there is a, a free ticket at home if you want to go fire up an Isilon cluster on your set of laptops at home or you're, you're with some, uh, some JBot plugged into it. You could do that or on a servers, white box servers that you have at home. You could go and download this directly off of the LEMC pages and go set up your own Iceland cluster and knock yourself out. What's the rough uh, price point on the paid version? Um, I'm trying to remember the exact number, but it's, it's, it's a few thousand dollars. Ballpark? You know, basically, yeah. It's not, it's not very expensive. Um, the intent there, again, is not to, you know, not to drive a lot of revenue out of it. The intent there is that if you have thousands and thousands of retail locations, we want to make sure that you can put a point of presence in each of those retail locations and then drive that data, sync IQ it back to the core, either for long-term preservation or for doing analytics or for whatever purpose. You're not usually just going to just keep it at the edge. What do you think about its uh, applicability for mid-market businesses that just have small single <clears throat> stations? Yeah, we think it's a great idea. The only, uh, um, and, and actually it's, it's nice in that it, because it runs at a VM, you can run other VMs on that particular white box and that they can basically be hyper-converged. So applications, storage, all on the same three node cluster. So three kind of three white box servers, if you will, where some of the drives are dedicated to 1FS for providing shared file services and maybe some of the drives are provided to other applications that are running on the same server. So you'd see this as a, a good option for your little 100, 200 person shop wanting that kind of feature set? It could be. We also have another uh, version of our product, which we call the Channel Bundle, which is a very low cost X210. It's a, the smallest node that we have. And it's a, a, you know, basically a 20K or 25K uh, solution for the, the smallest node capacity we have, which is 36 terabyte raw. So a good upgrade option if they want to start with the paid SD and then mm -hmm. move on. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Thank you. Yep. For Insight IQ um, and for Isilon in general, yeah. Has the UI moved to the new HTML5 based, like Unity style interface? Are we moving to HTML5 for that? Are we HTML5 for Inside IQ? 
It's not HTML5 today. Um, uh, you will see us over the course of the next release or two um, uh, change not to the same framework that Unity is using, uh, but to the same kind of design uh, uh, paradigms as, uh, as we uprev the infrastructure that Inside IQ sits on as well as the UI. And frankly, you'll see the two come together, uh, uh, at least from an infrastructure standpoint, uh, more and more as time goes forward. So this is basically an architectural drawing of how the SD Edge works in terms of actually running inside of a virtual machine. Uh, vCenter used to control it, V1FS management. Again, the minimum requirement is three servers because we need a quorum. So we need to have at least three. Um, we can go up to, up to six. Um, each of these basically consumes some amount of virtual CPU and it consumes some amount of VMDKs. Uh, but there's no single points of failure in this system. And for all intents and purposes, this looks to the administrator like a physical Isilon, except that it's just running in virtual machines. So would you use the hypervisor storage itself, um, like local disk inside each hypervisor? That's right. The VMDKs that are from the local disk inside the hypervisor, that's what's consumed by the uh, SD Edge. Uh, cloud pools, again, smart pools is a way of moving data into other nodes, and then cloud pools can move that data off into a public cloud or into a private cloud, or your, uh, um, if you want a managed service like uh, a VirtuStream. And that data, again, the metadata is kept here, so if you run a file system scan over here, you'd still see that all of the data files are in the place. Um, now, I'm, I'm kind of low on time, but I do want to point out again that our, our fo focus is really on verticals and vertical applications. So if you, we call them horizonticals because they're not just verticals, they're not just horizontal workloads. But if you look at any of the verticals that we operate in, there, uh, there's a number of different horizontals, whether they're home directories, archives, or commercial HPC. And in each of them, they kind of mean different things. So in, for example, media entertainment, you might have a media archive. But in healthcare, an archive would be a PAX or a home directory file share might be the equivalent of a PAX system. And these are where we focus our efforts. So when we go and we talk to our customers, we talk about their specific workloads and how our, our node types uh, accommodate those specific workloads, whether they be archive, home directories, analytics, geotagging, uh, hosting, quant type things in a financial services environment. Uh, we basically optimize our, our product around different solutions for specific verticals. Um, let me click forward. From a TCO perspective, the ability to go and consolidate all of those filer environments into a single filer, again, it eliminates white space, it eliminates uh, basically islands of storage, and allows you to share resources, whether it's performance or capacity across the node. And actually, when you go to manage it, you're managing that cluster as a single infrastructure, as opposed to, say, 10, 20, 30, or even a couple dozen uh, filers, and so it becomes much easier to manage from an operational perspective we drive operational costs down. And so we have an IDC report that talks about the actual cost to manage and cost to operate a cluster. And we just show that the, the Isilon way of doing it, which is this uh, you know, single uh, global namespace way of actually consolidating things into a single cluster, can reduce CapEx by 41% and OpEx by 48%. You know, competing technologies basically have all of these different uh, filers, then you know you might be using varying levels of capacity in each of the different filers, each of the different aggregates, volumes, file systems. Some of them might be full, some of them might be somewhat empty, some of them might be consuming a lot of performance, but they're all basically captive to that particular filer. And so this filer can't access capacity on that filer because that's just not the way they work. Volumes don't span filers or controllers. And so the point also is that as you grow an Isilon cluster, as you know, over time, the cost of storage tends to decrease. So our actual node prices also decrease uh, kind of at the same rate as the overall cost of storage. So I don't have to start by saying, hey, guess what? On day one, I have to guess how much capacity I need and go buy a frame with that much capacity. I buy how many nodes I need for the performance and capacity I need on that day and then I add nodes over time, and if this is over a four-year horizon, each of those years, the node prices I tend to erode, and so my actual CapEx is staggered, and I can defer CapEx into the future, and what's more is that the actual cost of storage comes down, 
and even new media becomes online. So now suddenly there's flash media that's available. And so I can add flash media into my, into my cluster, but I'm not stuck with whatever I bought on day one in that frame and the capabilities of that frame. And of course, the other thing that I don't have to worry about is <clears throat> uh, tech refreshes, right? So I'm gonna skip this for a moment, but I don't have to go, okay, well, it was an initial purchase. And then I go and I add some capacity and I fill up that node and oh my gosh, now I basically filled up the node. And so I have to go and buy a, a larger node or a larger uh, frame um, uh, because I've filled up the capacity and there's no th such thing as, like, hey, guess what? After five years, this uh, particular array is out of support. And so I do a forklift migration, put another array next to it and migrate all of the stuff into that array. It's just add nodes in um, and then take nodes out the back. So as nodes age out, you take them out, data is migrated into the new nodes, it's automatically rebalanced across the new nodes, and it just makes migration a thing of the past. There's no more migrations here, there's no more kind of forklift upgrades, all of that stuff that you see with traditional arrays goes away. Questions, thoughts? What's the, what's the support cost going after three years? What's the incremental upgrade, or up, uptick? Um, it bumps up about, like for us, it's a, um, about a 4% increase over what your initial three years was. It can vary depending year on customer. Over year or is it, does it go, you know, so if I'm running this thing year seven, uh -huh. what's the cost of support look like? Um, almost the same as year one for a lot of customers. It can, it's kind of variable. We're trying to move to more of a fixed support model. So that's like, you know, year one through three is at one rate, one rate. And then years four, five, six, and seven is at a slightly higher rate, but it's fixed. It doesn't, right. it's not like every customer sees whatever they negotiated. It's, gonna, it's just gonna be a fixed thing that we move to. But the net is that it's not that different. There'll be a slight bump because we wanna encourage you to move off of older technologies onto newer ones, but it's not like, uh, oh my gosh, all of a sudden we triple. Now, some, there's some variability in there, but we're obviously moving to standardize that to just a very simple uh, model going forward. Um, to hope that, hopefully that answers your question. Yep. Now, of course, you know, as we bring new operating systems on board, or as, uh, we, as we stop selling nodes, if we stop selling a node, we'll only support it for a certain amount of time. So it's, like it's five years from the date that we stop selling that node. So if we've moved from like the, uh, when we move from the NL400 to the NL410, when we end of life the NL400 or the X400, uh, then basically for five years it'll be supported, but at that point we're not gonna support it any longer. So you'll have to move to a new node type after that five years. Take the node out, put a new node in. Um, and that's as simple as it gets. The data will migrate over, yeah. everything's good to go. We're not gonna maintain a node and support it forever because obviously the capabilities of the, of the even the, the components inside just change and just keeping spare parts around for nodes that are 10, 15 years old is just not, not feasible. So the net net is the number of customers look at our products and they say, you know, this allows me to manage petabytes of scale with a tiny staff and scale easily so we don't have to worry about creating and managing volumes or managing a bunch of other things that create cost. That's CapEx. Provisioning maybe takes an, an, an hour, but before it took three to four hours a week, storage allocation is used five to six hours a week and now it takes us six hours a year. Actually, uh, you know, a lot of the customers who tell us that these, these are just simple operations and really one of the reasons that people like the Isilon uh, infrastructure architecture is just so simple to use and so simple to manage. Um, and the price points are just, you know, if you, if you really look at, you know, what other controller-based filers provide from a, you know, someone asked the question, how much is raw versus how much is usable? Uh, the raw to usable, that ratio on just uh, simple controller-based uh, uh, solutions tends to be pretty poor. And the fact that we can get into the 80 to 90% range in terms of usable storage is actually pretty unique in the industry. And, uh, and we're, we're pretty proud of that. So that's the end of the presentation. Uh, and so hopefully we answered all of your questions. If there are any other questions that you have, I mean, John and I are here to answer them. So feel free to fire away. There's a pretty, pretty dense overview of, uh, of our uh, feature. So I ran through it pretty quickly. Um, but then, you know, John really highlighted the complexity that you have when you're trying to do things not just across one controller, but you're trying to actually orchestrate and provide um, uh, consistency across 100 plus controllers where each one of them sees a piece of the, of the entire thing, but 
they all basically collaborate together to provide single services that span across the entire cluster. I could take a snapshot of an entire, I don't know, say like 20 or 30 nodes section of a cluster, um, and that has to be coordinated across all of those nodes.